So thank you all for being here, and uh, thank you especially to our uh, hosts for uh, giving us the opportunity uh, for all the wonderful discussions that we have had and hopefully will have. Um, what I want to do today is actually answer a very simple question, and that is, what precisely does Gandhi mean when he uses the terms secular and secularism? Okay, that's the general question that I want to answer. And the reason I think that's an important question is because if you look at the terms that Gandhi uses the, and the ways in which he uses these terms in his work, there appear to be contradictions. On the one hand, he repeatedly says something like, politics must be infused with religion or spirituality. And by the way, for him, those two terms, religion and spirituality, are kind of synonymous. So on the one hand, he keeps insisting, and in fact, yesterday, uh, Sarah, I believe, quoted that very famous line, there can be no politics without religion. Uh, and I, I don't remember the rest of it, but you quoted it very nicely, right? And this is something that occurs again and again and again in his thought. On the other hand, at many different times, he expresses a strong sentiment that religion and the state should remain separate that the state should not interfere with matters of religion, and so on and so forth. He, he repeatedly says the state should be secular. The state should be secular, right? So the question is, what exactly does he mean? How are we to make sense of this contradiction? Now, of course, all of us here, I presume, are, are sort of familiar with, with the, the fundamental assumption that the term secularism itself is not a clear one. It doesn't have a clear uncontested definition, and particularly in the Indian context, right, it has given rise to new meanings and a, a plurality of ways of thinking about the term secularism. But I want to ask specifically in Gandhi's thought, specifically in his political thinking, what does it mean? Okay, that's the specific focus of my question. Now, there are several ways we can approach this, right? One way is to say, look, Gandhi changed his views over time. This is a very common thing in his work. He himself very openly says, don't hold me to something I said last year or last month. What I hold true today may not be true tomorrow, right? This is a, this is a very clear commitment on his part that he doesn't, um, he's not really interested in consist consistency across time. Now, Ajay Skaria, who is a scholar of Gandhi at University of Minnesota, has actually considered that possibility. And he has said, okay, well, let's, if you, if you look at some of the statements he makes in the 1920s, right? There are all these statements about there can be no politics without religion, but then later in the 1940s, especially in 46 and 47, when the sort of violence of partition was, you know, becoming evident, you might say, well, those are the years in which all his statements about secular and secularism occur. So maybe what happened is that over time, he just changed his views. And as things got more and more tense, he sort of, his views evolved more towards secularism. But Skaria actually says that this is not really the right or plausible interpretation, because if you look at what he says in the 20s, there are also plenty of references in the 20s to there can be no religion without politics, and there are pl plenty of references in the 40s, or actually it's the other way around, there are plenty of references in the 20s to warnings against theocratic rule, and there are plenty of references in the 40s to there can be no religion without politics. So there's actually a kind of consistent contradiction over time, right? Which is why I think we have to make sense of this. So the other way to approach this is, um, is, is a way that I think uh, people like Sarah and Jacob and Balu have done, which is to say that Gandhi might have been using terms like religion and secularism in a kind of idiosyncratic way, but that we can look for coherent patterns of usage behind this apparently idiosyncratic way of using these terms religion and secularism. Now, I'm quite convinced by this. I'm quite convinced by this approach. I'm quite persuaded by it. And so, following this approach, uh, what I want to do is to say that if we push that approach even further, what we will actually find is that he uses the term religion in at least three different ways. And that will actually shed light for us on what he means by secular and secularism. So the real sort of meat of the problem, if you will, for me, the real meat of the problem is to look at how he's using religion. And so what I'll argue today 
what I'll try to convince you of today is that he uses religion in at least three different senses, three different ways in which he uses the term religion. There may be more, but the ones I've detected are three. And I'll call these religion one, religion two, and religion three. I apologize for the very sort of scientific, mathematical, analytic sound of this, but we'll refer to them uh, for shorthand as R1, R2, and R3. And of course, I'll explain to you what I mean by R1, R2, and R3, or what I think actually Gandhi would mean by them. So what I'll do is I'll begin by contrasting between R1 and R2, okay? And then I'll talk a little bit about R3. But basically, my argument today, what I'm going to try and convince you of today, is that Gandhi is very keen that religion understood it as R1. That first conception of religion is what should be brought to bear on politics when he says there can be no politics without religion. And it is religion understood as R2, which is the one that he is suspicious of, which he finds to be a kind of pernicious force in political life. So what I'll do is, I'll argue that if we want to make sense of Gandhi's conception of secularism, or if you want to figure out what does he mean when he says secular and secularism, what exactly does he have in mind? We actually have to ask, in what sense did Gandhi want religion to be a private matter? And in what sense did he want religion to be public? Okay, I think that's the crucial question. That's the central question that I think we have to ask. That is the most important question. And answering that question will illuminate the rest. And what I hope to be able to show you today is that once we explore that question, we'll see that Gandhi challenges this conceptual distinction between public and private, at least as it's traditionally understood in Western secular liberal thought. He completely turns that on its head. And he will make us, he will cause us to radically rethink that claim, that traditional secular liberal claim that religion properly belongs in the realm of the private and that is therefore not to be politicized. So that's my basic argument, a very brief summary of my argument. So let me start, as I promised, by addressing these three conceptions of religion, R1, R2, and R3. So R1, or religion one, is what I call private truth-seeking, or what I'm attributing to Gandhi as a conception of religion that is private truth-seeking a private activity of truth-seeking. Gandhi repeatedly insists, you hear him say this over and over again, that religion is one's private or personal affair. But I want to say that he has a very specific meaning of private in mind when he says this. It's not the traditional way in which the sort of modern secular liberal state conceives of religion as private. It's a very different understanding of private. And I think we need to pay very close attention to that. In order to understand this, we have to take a slight detour into some pretty uh, abstract sort of theoretical political philosophy territory, which I hope won't be too boring or too abstract, but we have to look at the distinction that Gandhi makes over and over again in his work between absolute and relative truth. Absolute and relative truth. And I'm, I'm going to be summarizing here you know, so I'll, I'll move very quickly through it and I apologize if, if people have questions about this. I've written about this elsewhere. But basically, the totality of absolute truth, he calls absolute truth the same as God, right? He says that it is so complex that it cannot be adequately captured by any one mind. The totality of truth is so complex that it cannot be manifested in any given human life entirely. Right? Now, he's highly influenced by the Jain tradition of Anekantavad here. But the idea is that human beings are only capable of partial knowledge. Most of us, in fact, almost all of us, are only capable of partial moral knowledge about truth. And therefore, no single specific human view can claim to represent absolute truth. Because we only have access to a series of limited and partial truths, which he calls relative truth, right, which always sounds at first like a kind of contradiction in terms. But the idea for Gandhi is that all of these relative truths participate in the absolute truth. And therefore, one can never claim any finality about one's moral conclusions. One must always hold oneself open to correction. 
because we realize that our capacity to know moral truth is limited. It is also subject to constant revision, right? This is part of making sense of that claim that what I hold true today may not be true tomorrow. It's because we, all of us, including Gandhi himself, must constantly hold our relative truths open and subject to revision. But I want to emphasize one very important thing here. What really matters for Gandhi is the activity of seeking truth through practice. It is the activity of continually seeking through truth through repeated habits and actions and practices. And so we arrive at these kind of provisional truths about the right action to be taken in a specific situation for a specific reason. I think it's really impossible to overemphasize the extent to which Gandhi privileges the activity of truth seeking over the certain knowledge of truth. Now, it's true that Gandhi keeps saying over and over again that we must have the goal of attaining absolute truth in mind. Yes, that is true. But he also repeatedly reminds us that it's very dangerous for us to rest with the belief that we have in fact attained the absolute truth. Because resting in that belief, that certainty of having knowledge, takes us away from the continued activity of seeking, right? This is what Gandhi is most concerned with. He's very preoccupied with the processes and the activities and the actions and the practices that cultivate our access to truth. Much more so than our knowing the truth with certainty, if that makes sense. So, when he says that religion should be a private matter, I think he's using both the terms religion and the terms private in a very specific sense. And in this case, he's thinking of religion in the sense of dharma as activity. And I think Ajay Skarya does a very nice job here of distinguishing between what he calls nischay dharma and vyavahar dharma. The term vyavahar came up yesterday, right? But in this context, or at least the way that Skarya talks about it, nischay dharma is the dharma that seeks to know the intrinsic form of things, right? The absolute truth. But for Gandhi, Skarya says, and now I'm quoting Skarya, this is not my claim, this is Skarya's claim, that nischay dharma is secondary to vyavahara dharma. The, the dharma of everyday transactions, everydayness, everyday life, everyday practice. And in fact, I think it's not just Skarya, it's Akhil Belgrami and Uday Mehta and a whole generation of people who are now all working on Gandhi in very interesting and new ways. They all agree on this fundamental point. They all agree that there is a privileging in Gandhi's thought of truth as experiential, right? Truth is something we experience. It's not something we know. It's not cognitive. Actually, that's Bill Grammy's uh, term that I've just stolen. Bill Grammy says, it is only our moral experience which is capable of being true or untrue, right? So all of them reject the idea that for Gandhi, truth is something that is cognitive that we know, right? Rather, it is something that's instantiated through everyday practices of seeking. It is not about the finality of coming to know it in any absolute formal manner. I hope that makes sense. So back to this conception of religion that I'm calling R1, which I characterize as R1, right? Why is it private? What is distinctive about the privateness of that conception of religion? I think we have to go back to what Gandhi says about conscience. The conscience is a crucial, central instrument for truth seeking. He says, Gandhi says, the individual conscience is the voice of God, which is, of course, for him, the voice of truth. And he says, the call of the conscience is the main vehicle for accessing the truth. So when Gandhi says religion is a private and personal affair, I think he means it in a very, very deep sense. It's between you and your God, and nobody else and nothing else. Sudhir Chandra, who's another Gandhi scholar, says, it is when you find yourself alone with your God. That's what truth-seeking is for Gandhi. It's a deeply experiential thing. It's an interactive relationship between you and the deepest part of yourself, that part of you which Gandhi says all of us have, and that part has a special connection to the truth that is God. So when he says it's private, it means it's yours. 
and nothing and nobody else can interfere between you and this experience that you're having. But here's the thing, folks. Here's the thing that I think is so interesting. This does not mean that those private practices of truth-seeking, which are driven by the conscience, cannot be brought to bear on public political matters, right? Quite the opposite. If you look at, if you look at sort of Gandhi, you, you find that he's particularly adept at taking things that are private practices of truth-seeking, right? Things like fasting or you know, all the, the sort of constant preoccupation with celibacy and the body, right? Things that we think of are sort of restricted to the personal or private sphere. He constantly bring those to, brings those to bear on political matters. And he constantly advises that likewise the rest of us should similarly be thinking about diet and nutrition and hygiene and sexuality and sexual practices and what we do with our bodies, right? All these things that certainly from a kind of Western liberal perspective can strike us as very private and personal. He says, no, those things are political and they must be brought to bear. Practices must be brought to bear on our political life. But he does so precisely through practice, right? Not by dogmatic declarations of truth as a principled commitment. That's not the sense in which he says our private practice of religion should be brought to bear in public life. This is what he means when he says there can be no politics without religion. This is the sense in which some people take Gandhi to be an anti-secularist because they think he wants there to be a mixing between religion and politics. Yes, that's true. But that mixing, that infusion has to occur in a very specific way. One's relationship to truth, to God, to the inner voice is deeply private in the sense that it's a relationship only subject to one's inner experience. But at the same time, one's practices of truth seeking through this experience, not one's dogmatic declarations of knowing truth, but one's practices of truth seeking, one's experiences can and even must be brought to bear on one's actions in the political realm. So I think Ashish Nandi is right when he says that if secularism means the evacuation of all religion understood as truth-seeking from politics, this is definitely not Gandhi's conception of secularism, absolutely not. Rather, Gandhi wants religion as the repository or the expression of moral values to be available in politics for checking corruption and violence and other ills of political life. I think Nandi is quite right when he says this. Another way that Nandi says this is, he says, we want the right kind of religious faith to find expression in public life rather than the wrong kind. I think he's quite right here, but I want to say we had to push the point even further. I want to make an addendum to Nandi's point, to Nandi's notion of the right kind of religious faith for Gandhi. It's not simply that there's a good kind of faith that is tolerant of otherness and a bad kind of faith that is xenophobic and anti-democratic and intolerant and all those other things. I mean, that may be true, Nandi may be right about that, but that's not the important claim. I think the problem is that Nandi and others don't go far enough in distinguishing the right kind of faith from the wrong kind of faith for Gandhi. I think the right kind of faith for Gandhi is the version of faith that is deeply private in that very strict sense that I just described. It's the kind that struggles with truth through action. It's the kind of faith that keeps a continuous connection of the conscience to its own truth-seeking experience. And moreover, when this form of private faith is brought to bear on public political matters, Gandhi in insists that it should be done so in an experiential, action-oriented manner, through one's example, through exemplary actions not through declaring one's principal commitment to a truth, not through saying, I know the truth and therefore that truth should influence politics, no. But through demonstrating exemplary action, that is to say action that others can model their behavior on, through a series of practices that are engaged in truth seeking, in the activity of truth seeking, not in resting with the knowledge of truth. I hope that distinction is clear. So that's R1. So now what I want to do is I want to contrast R1 with R2. Religion 1 with religion true, 2. And religion 2 is what I'll call this principled commitment to absolute or doctrinal truth. 
It is this latter conception of religion as absolute principled commitment, which I will call R2, that's my term. And I think Gandhi is deeply troubled and very suspicious of that. And I think that is the conception that he's referring to when he says the state should be secular, that we don't want a certain kind of religion invading political life. So what are we talking about when we talk about this R2, right? What do I mean by religion too? As doctrinal truth or principled commitment. I think actually the best way to describe it is to kind of lean a little bit on the work of people like Jacob and Sarah and Barlow, who I think have, they've done some very, very nice work on this. They have described it as a concept of truth that is prevalent in Semitic or Abrahamic religions. And in those religions, and then again, I'm, here I'm just characterizing their work and kind of leaning on it because I think it's so good. Religions are a matter of mutually exclusive truth and falsity, right? So either a doctrine is true or it's false. And then of course, if one believes the truth of a particular doctrine, then all the others are necessarily false, right? And one is obliged to combat the existence of these so-called false doctrines. And Akhil Bilgrami also talks a little bit about this in slightly different language. But basically, you know, Bilgrami and Jacob and Sarah and Balu have all done, I think, a great job of addressing what this particular understanding of religious truth is. So I don't think we need to do much more here than to point out that this conception of religion understood in this inflexible, doctrinal, sort of mutually exclusive truth versus falsehood way is what Gandhi is suspicious of. And in order to sort of explain that claim, I think we have to go back to seeing what Gandhi says about absolute truth. He says, first of all, he says, it's for me, it is my God, it is God. It is eternal and unchanging, he says, okay? But, he says, it is almost impossible to know or reach that truth in human form. I think we must pay attention to the fact that Gandhi was so skittish so wary, so careful about saying that you can reach or that you have reached the absolute truth. It's not just that it's difficult to know that truth, it's also that you must know it if you can know it at all through practice rather than belief. Again, we are back to the same privileging of practice and activity. And again, Gandhi, I think, is worried that the notion that you have the truth leads again to this emphasis on doctrines and propositions and beliefs and principal commitments, right? It leads to an emphasis on those things over simply practicing the truth. Again, I think Gandhi is very concerned that it takes us away from the constant seeking if it allows us to rest in the certainty that we have the truth. So I think it is this conception of religion which I'm calling R2, religion 2, understood as inflexible or principled commitment, which I think Gandhi finds to be a very destructive force within politics. And he says over and over again, he says, the claim to have reached absolute truth would be a most dangerous claim to make. He calls it dangerous, right? Why would he call it dangerous? Why does he say it's dangerous? Now, one answer I think has been given by people like uh, Karuna Mantena, who's another very interesting Gandhi scholar, who's doing a, a, a book on Gandhi. And she says that she's done great work. And, and her work reminds us that Gandhi is very sensitive to this danger that idealism and strong attachment to principle can sort of um, lead to a kind of entrenchment, a kind of ideological entrenchment in politics. So what does that mean? I'll, I'll quote from Mantena's article, one of Mantena's articles, to give you a sense of what this means. She says, I quote, the worry is, and here she's characterizing, I think, Gandhi's worry, the worry is that when political disagreements are framed as arguments over fundamental principles, the potential for political progress may dissipate in an atmosphere of increasing hostility and polarization, end quote. So I think she's put it very well. This is one reason that Gandhi is so wary, so careful of having these fundamental, absolute, inflexible, principled commitments being brought to bear on politics. But I think there's a, something else going on also. I, I don't think that's the full answer. That's part of the answer. Something else is going on. I think there's another sense in which Gandhi means that the preponderance or the predominance of R2 over R1 is a very dangerous thing for politics. This has to do 
with the real harm that I think is done to Gandhi's conception of R1 by R2. So what do I mean by this? Let me explain. When Gandhi says that religion is a personal or a private affair, I think he's also very concerned that this private conception of religion should not be subject to the doctrinal authority of religious structures and institutionalized faiths who are attempting to control the conscience. Now, he doesn't actually say this. This is my interpretation, okay? I think this is a real worry for Gandhi. I think he's very concerned about this. He's concerned that R2 will trump R1. He's concerned that the everyday, the practice and action-oriented understanding of religion as this kind of private, conscientious truth-seeking will somehow be displaced, will somehow be replaced with an idea of religion as inflexible, doctrinal, principled commitment. Now, one way that I think we can see this concern is by following the debates around his aversion to proselytizing and conversion, which again, uh, Sarah and, and Jacob and Balu have done great work on. Uh, but the real problem with conversion, I think, is that Gandhi sees it as based on a mistaken conception of religious truth, which emphasizes doctrine over practice, R2 over R1. And if you look at these, you know, somewhat tense exchanges that he has with these missionaries, the thing he comes back to over and over again, he repeatedly questions, he says, why is the goal obtaining this confession of belief in Christian principles, such as Christ is the savior or the only son of God? Why go to such lengths, he says, he asks, he asks missionaries these questions, right? Why are you going to such lengths to get people to explicitly sort of adopt a certain principle or commitment? and a certain religious affiliation, instead of simply practicing truth through exemplary action, right, and encouraging others to similarly practice and seek truth through action. Why is the goal the belief, right? The confession of belief, why is that the goal? And of course, you know, they go back and forth, he and the missionaries, but the answer, I think, is actually that missionary work is focused on solidifying doctrine and belief and principled commitment, absolute principled commitment. And that's the worry for Gandhi. I think for Gandhi, the worry is, and again, by the way, this is, this is not my view, this is my interpretation of Gandhi, just to be very, very clear on what I'm saying, right? I'm interpreting a particular concern that I think Gandhi must have, that this kind of missionary work or this kind of proselytizing can exert an undue pressure on the individual conscience. It can sort of mislead the conscience by emphasizing R2, over R1 by saying, no, what really matters is that you have the right belief, the right commitment, the right principle. And in so doing, I think Gandhi would, would say that there's a real harm done to R1. There's a harm done to that truth, that concept of religion as private, conscientious, truth-seeking activity. Because now the insistence is that the conscience must pledge allegiance to a series of doctrinal truths and principles, which are then supposed to regulate or guide action and practice. I think that's what Gandhi is really concerned with in all his sort of struggling with missionaries and proselytizing. He's concerned that the individual conscience, which is that delicate instrument of R1, comes under a kind of pressure. And he's concerned that this pressure that's being brought to bear on it by missionaries or proselytizers is not really about allowing the truly, truly, truly private practice of truth seeking through the conscience. It's far more interested in persuading the conscience toward a particular R2 conception of belief. Okay, but what does this have to do with secularism, right? As, because I began by saying that's what I'm trying to make sense of. What does this have to do with Gandhi's conception of secularism? I think what Gandhi is doing here, and again, this is me interpreting Gandhi, this is me reading on to Gandhi, he's warning us about the danger of the modern Western secular liberal state adopting this R2 conception of religious truth and moving us away from the conception of religion as activity and practice, R1. And again, this is something that, you know, people like Sarah and Jacob and Balu have, have done great work on. I think they've demonstrated very nicely that the modern Western state's conception of religion sort of accepts, right, uncritically the Abrahamic or the Semitic concept of religion so that 
there's this idea that the truth of one necessarily implies the falsity of others. I think they've very convincingly argued this and they've shown us that this liberal Western version of secularism, it construes freedom of religion as inclusive of the freedom to propagate one's own religion. And in so doing, what is it actually doing? It's actually privileging a certain R2 conception of religion over all others. So it's not neutral at all, right? And I'm not saying anything new here. I'm, I'm once again leaning on um, the great work that our hosts have done. But again, I think there's an even further problem from Gandhi's perspective. I think we need to push even further. I think that for Gandhi, when the state implicitly sees all religions as competitors, as rival movements, who should all go off and gather as many adherents as they can, it encourages the view of religion as private in the wrong sense. I think that's the problem. It's that sense of private which you see as very prevalent again in sort of Western liberal conceptions, right? This is the private sphere, this is the public sphere. In the public sphere, these are the things that are permissible and the rest all just goes into the private sphere and fights it out and the state has nothing to do with it, right? I think that's not the right conception of private at all for Gandhi. Because what that does is that it turns this so-called private realm of belief into a kind of ideological battlefield where all these various doctrinal belief systems are sort of going at it, you know, off against one another. But the problem from Gandhi's perspective is that they're doing so by attempting to win the allegiance of individual consciences, right? They're putting pressure on people's consciences. So this conception of the private sphere in which religion operates is exactly the wrong one for Gandhi. If it means that the true privacy of the individual's struggle with her own conscience, that R1 conception that I talked about, that privacy should be subject only to the relationship between her and her God. Remember that? It's between you and your God. Suddenly, that conscience becomes the object of attention and appropriation by representatives of these doctrinal religions, all attempting to win validity for their truth claims. Right? This is what I think Gandhi is worried about because he says they're only interested in claiming believers for their abstract principled commitments. Even further, this model of religious competition in the so-called private sphere is focused mostly on the spreading of ideals or principles, not on practices and actions, not on pursuing truth-seeking toward practicing right action for Gandhi. So this notion of freedom of conscience, it, get, it gets reduced to a kind of competition among various doctrinal truth systems, which are all vying for adherence. Meanwhile, the state is ostensibly claiming to be neutral amongst all of them, right? Saying, oh, no, no, you guys all fight it out, when in fact it has actually implicitly taken a position on what constitutes religion, right? And the upshot of all of this for Gandhi is that religion is no longer private in the sense that truly, truly matters. Namely, it's no longer a matter of her own deeply private struggle to be conducted in her private relationship and interaction with the divine. So, to come back in a very long-winded way to the opening question, when Gandhi says that the state should be secular and that religion and state should be separate, I think what he means is that when the state takes a position on what religion is, and that position leads to competition among these abstract doctrinal truth claims, that gets in the way of the truly private practice of religion. I think that's what he really means. Now I said, I promised you at the beginning that there's a third concept of religion, a third sense, a third way in which Gandhi uses the term religion. And this is the way that has shown up in the work, again, of people like Jacob and Sarah and Balu. There's a kind of communitarian, a community-oriented sense in which Gandhi uses the term religion, right? And I think um, they have called it religion as ancestral community practice, right? This idea that, you know, religion is something communal. It's shaped by the power of traditions, right? And uh, let me quote, actually, from them, because I think this will be helpful. Uh, that they consist of, quote, ancestral practices that serve as action heuristics, instructing the individual on how to become a better human being, 
So a kind, kind of guidance for everyday practice, right? And I think, that, I think that's quite right, but I think Gandhi would say that there, there are instances when religion can be a supplement. I'm sorry, let me start over. There are instances in which communities can be a supplement or a support to individual private truth-seeking, but there are also situations in which they can become a hindrance, right? I think Gandhi would say that when religious communities are sort of largely polycentric, unorganized, right, not highly differentiated with solid boundaries, I think that's the conception of community, religious community that Gandhi has in mind that can sort of guide the conscience along, give guidance for everyday practice. Precisely because they focus on the everydayness of action and practice, not on belief in doctrines or absolutes, right? And again, to quote um, from one of uh, the co-authored papers by Jacob and Sarah and Balu, quote, unlike religious doctrines and other beliefs about the world, such heuristics or rules of thumb are not subject to truth claims. They are instructions for action, whose efficacy is always relative to the experience, context, and inclinations of the individual in question, unquote. So very contextual, very much based on practice and sort of everydayness and guidance for action rather than on what is the belief in truth, right? But there's a danger for Gandhi, I think. I think Gandhi will say there's a danger that when the communities suddenly become sort of highly differentiated from one another, right? When the boundaries between those communities become solidified and suddenly, and, and this, is a, this is something that our hosts have argued has happened in India recently or not, not so recently, but over a span of time. And I think, you know, one of the words used is the semiticization or the monothe monotheization of religious communities, right? So what happens then? The conceptions of truth can suddenly become much more absolutized, right? There can be a shift. I think Gandhi would worry that there can be a shift in focus from this kind of guidance in activity and practice toward these abstract claims about we know the truth, this is the truth, and that's what makes you a Hindu or a Muslim or a Christian or what have you, right? So I think Gandhi is worried that communities in certain senses can be a support, can be a complement, can help and guide individuals to seek truth, but there's a danger, right, that if they sort of slide into this other model of community, then instead of getting guidance for everyday action, we suddenly get belief systems and doctrinal truth claims, what I called R2. And I think Gandhi would say those are a hindrance. He talks a lot about individuals being able to practice their religion without hindrance. So what could he mean by hindrance? I think that's what he means by hindrance. I think he would say that is a hindrance rather than a form of support for private, conscience-driven truth-seeking. So I promise to be brief. I don't think I've done that. Um, but I, am, I promise you I'm about to conclude. I think this helps us arrive at an understanding of how Gandhi envisioned the appropriate relationship between individuals, the state, and various religions in a multi-religious polity like India. When he uses the term secular in a positive sense, meaning when he claims over and over again that the state should be secular and that each of us should be allowed to profess our religion without hindrance, I think what he means is that each of us should be left alone on our private path to truth-seeking. Now let's be very clear what I mean by left alone. I don't think by left alone Gandhi would say we can't even have the support of our communities or our traditional sort of guidance systems. No, that's not what he means. I think I've made it clear that in certain circumstances those communities can be very supportive. What he means by left alone, and again, this is my language, I fully acknowledge this is my language, not Gandhi's, this is me interpreting Gandhi. What he means is left alone, not literally, but in a kind of existential sense. That is, we are going to figure it out for ourselves through repeated practice and habit and struggle. He is envisioning a truly individual, conscience-driven search for truth. Repeated practice and occasionally, I think, guidance from a community as long as that community is providing the right kind of support. 
It is when this traditional guidance in the practice of truth seeking becomes transformed into something else, when it gets transformed into competition among various sort of doctrines with their inflect, each with their inflexible principle truth claims, that everything starts to go awry. Everything starts to go wrong for Gandhi. And suddenly the relationship between individuals, communities and the state also starts to fall apart. Individual consciences start to come under pressure and Gandhi worries that they can be led away from that private activity of truth seeking correctly understood and communities start to focus on ideological entrenchment, certainty of my knowledge about the truth. We know the truth, this is the truth as we see it and your truth is false. And then the state claims to stand apart from all that religious competition and it further exacerbates the situation as I've already explained. That's, how Gan that, that's what Gandhi is very, very concerned with. In contrast, I think what Gandhi is suggesting is not that religion should be banished into that private sphere of competition among religions, no. But that the activity of truth seeking should be understood as private in the correct way in the right sense. That is to say, it should not be subject to appropriation by the forces of religious doctrine. Instead, private truth seeking correctly understood must focus on repeated practice and action, and it must be brought to bear on public political matters through precisely such practices and actions. And I think it is in this sense that Gandhi claims there must be no separation between religion and politics. So I think I'll just stop there and hopefully we can have some good conversation. Thank you. Attempting to understand Gandhi in terms of the distinction that Farah makes in terms of R1, R2 and R3 complicates the, it further than it actually solves or simplifies the problem because, see, I think as Jacob and uh, Vivek pointed out, See, within the framework of, that is a kind of framework set by our, the, the research group, that's Balu, Sarah, and there's another way of looking at it. So completely uh, discarding this R1, R2, R3. See, for example, try to understand Gandhi as a person who intuitively understood about India and Indian culture, but when he was actually, in fact, communicating it, though he, the, all these terms that he understands, like uh, dharma, satya, ahimsa, and all these things, you know, get distorted and become a uh, comet topos. Therefore, see, it is not that Gandhi was actually making a distinction between these things, but the, 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 the kind of distance uh, between his intuitive understanding and the way he was trying to express it in terms of these concepts create problems. Uh, therefore, you can give many such examples. Say, if you, instead of that, if you look at this as, you know, Gandhi was trying to understand the other religions as you know, within India as variant of the traditions in India, that I think will throw light, better light on this kind of issues. Say, for example, the, grave, the famous debate about whether there is a scriptural sanction for the practice of untouchability. When Gandhi in the beginning thought that there are scriptural sanctions and went about and later on, you know, took a U-turn and said that even if there are uh, sanctions, I don't care. So, I think this way of understanding Gandhi, we, otherwise it gives an impression that we can make use of these terms which created problems to, you know, we expect them to solve the problems. Thank you. When he came from South Africa and started, uh, involved himself in the freedom struggle, a particular press reporter put a question, what is your conception of God? So the Mahatma Gandhi instantly replied, my conception of God is truth. And in the 1940s, the same person approaches him and asks, did you change your conception of God? Then he says, 
truth is god so the same person if you read the biography you get to know so first is god is truth and 20 to 25 years later it becomes vice versa truth is god this is one aspect the second one as madam pointed out religion sh shall become part of politics now if one examines the seven principles which mahatma gandhi practiced till the end of his lifetime that itself is the clear answer for example he was saying politics without principles wealth without work knowledge without character commerce without humanity pleasure without conscience worship without god remember we worship without sacrifice these have become part of religion and in fact he was telling he was a child of his own time and he had to make this because circumstances made me we are living in a freedom struggle during the course of freedom struggle he was a leader and as a leader everyone was approaching him so these canons came in pleasure without conscience worship without sacrifice science without humanity i can just give you one more instance margaret margaret brook white happened to be the editor of life magazine madam margaret brook white met mahatma gandhi at 2 pm on january 30th this was the last interview he gave and afterwards he was assassinated in just one and a half hours a question was put to mahatma after this was, this was the last question which was put and the last question was very simple would you still persist in your doctrine of non violence if a nuclear bomb is put on your city inhabited by people mahatma gandhi coolly looked at the lady and replied by saying we are not worried about it we still pray for the innocent innocent soul who has spread death on humanity that was the kind of compassion he had still spread death on humanity then in addition to it if you look to the other writings he was saying non violence is the law of human beings which he has been saying all through all throughout non violence is the law of human beings and violence is the law of the brute courage consists not in killing others but in dying for others this, this, this instrument the, the, the statements which are made not only it was made to be applied during the uh, political times even uh, when we when he spoke about religion thank you uh, first of all i wish to thank fara for her lucid uh, paper i thought that what the paper was trying to do is to clarify some of the very loaded and crucial concepts and in the process gives us a i'm not a gandhi scholar i must confess but it tries to give us a, a, a figure out a certain kind of gandhi which i found very interesting um it seems to me that gandhi is responding to all the crucial terms and categories that are coming that are invading uh during his time his lifetime or even before that but he was he was he was receiving them in a very strange way he, what what can be called a kind of responsive reception that is that he is receiving them but he is responding to them there is there is also responsibility involved in this response as well so all the very important categories if i were to go by the paper um the the categories which i think vivek was pointing out very clearly they set up a certain kind of framework uh, whether the framework is important or not whether gandhi realized it as a scholar or not is i think is is not very important but the way he is responding to these terms this very loaded and and then um epistemically entrenched terms from a from abrahamic traditions gandhi was responding to them and then receiving them but responding to them in a different way i think this very responsive reception itself it seems to me um might help us not to reduce gandhi to colonial consciousness there is a kind of translation that is taking place but this is a different translation i think sadanand was also hinting at that something else is happening here he, this responsibility and responding to what is received invasively that is coming in but it he kind of inflects in a creative way that is something which i uh, i find very significant and this seems to me that that this responsive reception is something that is coming to gandhi and 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 this is my speculation 
because you will see such kind of responsive receptions all along in the, in the Indian reflective and creative traditions. That is that the ways in which, for example, the Mahabharata has been received from Sanskrit into multiple Indian languages, you will see this creative, responsive reception of the epic. And I mean, may, one can multiply examples. I work in various areas, and I see that in, in literary critical traditions, literary inquiries uh, for about 1,200 years, similar kind of responsive reception, reception takes place. And this is non-theoretical. You know, it does not try to foreground theoretically explicate the problems, but it receives them, and then in the process of reception, transforms what it receives. This is a very significant thing that I notice in the Indian tradition. In the context of that, I thought that the terms that you were using uh, for our, from, from Ajay, they looked a little, um, uh, I mean, I felt a little, uh, you know, jarring in the sense that there is nothing like Nishchaya Dharma in Sanskrit traditions, as far as I'm concerned. I think he's replacing Paramartika Dharma with uh, Nishchaya Dharma. There isn't anything like that. And Paramartika Dharma is all the time discussed in the context of the Vyavaharika, in the context of living in the, in the world, uh, in, in Sanskrit traditions. Now, I want to move on from this, these general remarks that um, the responsive reception is something that one can notice in Gandhi, and that might help us, uh, you know, not reduce Gandhi to a certain kind of colonial distortion. Uh, that might help us to think, and I want to ask Farah, and the, this is for common interest and our common effort here. Now that we have recognized that there is an alternative way of re receiving European, powerful European or Abrahamic conceptual categories and traditions, but inflect them, respond to them in different ways and transform them in the process of reception, do you think it is possible for us uh, within the fields we work to set up research projects? Like, for instance, you work in political theory. Is it possible for us to come together uh, across the field and then suggest something that, you know, that what happens to these dominant hegemonic categories, now you realize that something else is happening, the way the notions of secular have been used, the way religion has been used. Is it possible for us to think of, conceive a research project where people can come together and do what Balu calls, I think, uh, a comparative science of cultures with specified backgrounds? Okay, that's the question. Thank you. Keeping uh, uh, Professor Venkatrao's uh, reaction as a reference point, I wonder whether we can now say whether Gandhi had colonial consciousness or not. Because uh, it requires appropriate studies. For example, this paper, it doesn't allow us to understand Gandhi. Uh, it, it makes uh, three categories of religion. And I still have a question, why not four or five categories? Like uh, Gandhi's uh, uh, reformation movements, uh, or whatever it may be. Because here, the, uh, R2 refers to doctrinal religion, whatever we call uh, uh, religion in proper. And uh, converts Gandhi into a Protestant Christian when he speaks about uh, R1, as the earlier uh, responses have pointed out. Therefore, we don't know what Gandhi is speaking about in uh, R1 and especially R1. Unless we have another alternative theory to understand what Gandhi is speaking in R1, we cannot uh, tell anything about uh, uh, his colonial consciousness, he, uh, he has colonial consciousness or not. And in case of R2 also, or R1 also, he is responding to a particular political situation because he is not simply talking about a personal uh, experience of God, but he is, according to this paper, he is bringing it to uh, the statement that politics and religion should not be separate. So he is talking in it in the context of politics. That means Gandhi made all these statements in different uh, uh, contexts of his life, responding to different uh, challenges he faced and, or responding to different political or situations. So it leaves uh, uh, one uh, broad uh, uh, conclusion that Gandhi was using a particular term religion in whichever way he liked. So we have to analyze it. I don't think that is not proper. That is why only way is to develop alternative theories 
about uh, the terms Gandhi was using and the concepts Indians are using, like dharma or whatever it may be, then approach Gandhi and then show the overlappings, then I think uh, that is the proper way of understanding Gandhi. Then we, we will be able to say whether Ga how Gandhi was uh, 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 able to uh, understand these events, whether it was, there was any overlapping of colonial consciousness or not. Uh, Farah? Yeah, thank you. So I have to say that I'm, uh, uh, you know, grateful for all the feedback. I'm certainly um, interest, interested to see how critical most of the feedback was, uh, but that's certainly part of the uh, process of scholarly engagement, is to, is to kind of engage with the critical feedback um, and to try to get something constructive out of it. Um, so let me see if I can try and do that. There's a lot that's been put on the table, and I must confess that I'm not yet able to um, really uh, sort of fully grasp all of it. So I'll do my best to respond based on what I think I've understood. Um, and hopefully uh, that'll be adequate. So, um, and I won't go in any particular order because I think there's kind of broad currents um, of thought under which some of these critiques uh, can be sort of subsumed. So I'll kind of respond to those broad currents. Um, hopefully it'll be helpful. So I guess I really, um, sort of resist the idea that um, methodologically the way to go about this is to sort of have a hypothesis and then test the hypothesis. I think that's a very, very scientistic, um, very Baconian, Hobbesian methodological model and not one that I uh, ascribe to. And I'm, you know, it's, 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 it's a fine model and, and but I, I have real problems with um, applying that particular scientistic model um, to what I consider to be a, a much more open-ended, fluid and flexible creative process of hermeneutics, frankly. So I'm not sure that that's, um, that's, that's a model that, that needs to kind of intervene here. But that said, you know, um, I think this actually takes us back to yesterday's discussion about, you know, I, I forget who asked the question. Someone asked the question yesterday that if you're talking about distortion, then you have a kind of underlying normative ideal of what is non-distorting, right, underlying that. And I think that discussion is intervening here a little bit. Um, and certainly that discussion is intervening in some of the claims made that my own paper is a distortion, right? Because if you're going to make claims about distortion, then you've got some kind of underlying, I think somewhat singular ideal of what is correct interpretation. And I actually, I've written about this elsewhere in my own work, I actually reject that whole model of interpretation. Um, I actually think interpretation is a much more fluid and flexible and open-ended thing. And the minute you start to talk about distortions, you've then sort of led yourself into the territory of then, okay, then what is the singular correct monolithic interpretation of a particular thinker? I just, I, I really don't sort of buy that at all. And, that, that, and that's a methodological disagreement that I think we can have. Um, I am much more inclined to say, and I've you know, said this elsewhere in my work, that a thinker like Gandhi is not someone to whom we are going to ascribe a singular monolithic interpretive um, set of ideas or, or, or set of ideas in our process of interpreting him, that engaging with Gandhi can be, as, as I think you put it, Venkat, um, you know, in a sense, it's what I'm doing, is, is I'm responding to a lot of what Gandhi is putting out. And it may be that my response to Gandhi has resulted in, um, either a creative reinterpretation or even a creative misreception of Gandhi, right? And these are things that are, are spoken about in sort of in hermeneutics uh, and in debates about uh, interpretation. So I sort of, I, I reject the idea that this is a distortion. Um, I, I definitely think it is a re-understanding and a reinterpretation. Um, and it may even be a creative misreception. Um, but I don't think it's a distortion. Uh, and I think that, that that boils down to a kind of methodological interpretive uh, disagreement. Okay, let's see what else we have here. Uh, I wasn't actually putting this into a debate about Indian secularism at all. Uh, that was never my claim. Uh, and I think you're right to say that it would be a mistake to put this into an Indi Indian debate on secularism. Um, I'm not taking a position on that. That's not uh, a debate into which I was trying to insert Gandhi at all. Some people do think it's absurd to, to make the claim that there is an Indian secularism, um, but that's a very large debate. And I don't think, actually, I, I disagree entirely that 
the meaning of secularism is very clear even the, in the West. I mean, somebody was, was saying this actually on another panel on secularism yesterday, that even within the West, what actually secularism mean, it means is quite contested. So uh, I don't agree with that at all. But I actually wasn't making any claims about what secularism means in the West or in India. I was really just engaging in an interpretation of Gandhi. Um, so let's see, what else? Um, I'm trying to make sure I get, I sort of hit all the points, and I apologize if I didn't quite grasp or understand absolutely everything that was put on the table. Um, I thought, Venkat, that your uh, elucidation or your clarification about uh, Gandhi as responding to the kind of crucial terms and categories that are invading, I think that was a very helpful clarification. And so in a sense, what he is doing is also a kind of creative reinterpretation, I think, right? He is receiving those terms, um, as you said, in a kind of responsive way, right? And then engaging in the process of uh, responsibly, I, I really like that word, responsibly uh, responding to them. And I, I have to say that I really agree with you, Venkat, that we, we cannot simply reduce Gandhi here to someone who is sort of invaded by colonial consciousness. And by the way, I, I'm sort of baffled actually by the claim that I'm reducing Gandhi to a Protestant uh, because that's not how I saw what I was doing at all. I wonder if that's an imposition of Protestant categories on Gandhi actually. Um, so I have, I have to confess I didn't quite um, sort of grasp your question, your, your final question, Venkat. Uh, exactly. I thought you said, now that we have recognized that there's an alternative way of receiving Abrahamic traditions and categories, is it possible within us, is it possible within our fields to set up research projects and suggest something about what happens to these dominant hegemonic categories? I would say absolutely yes, and I would say that that's actually what Gandhi was engaged in, and that's one reason that I am um, so, in, so interested in this particular way of interpreting Gandhi, because I think it opens up a whole new vista it opens up a whole new way for us to sort of think about what it is that we are doing in our respective disciplines, right? It, like that in a sense, we sort of follow Gandhi's example in sort of responding to and receiving, um, receiving and responding responsibly to, right? These, these conceptions, these sort of imposed conceptions that we now want to um, kind of reinterpret. So I don't know if that answers everything, but I hope that's good for a first cut. Thank you, Farah. It was uh interesting thing to reflect upon. I want to draw together comments that the panel members have made and the comments have made uh, because in some sense I don't think you quite address the concerns. But I'll formulate them as puzzles. <clears throat> Take your, for example, just now you ended. You don't quite see how Gandhi's conception is Protestant. Let me explain how. If you take the R1 and R2 that you formulate, the idea that religion is a private affair between man and God and that each man seeks his, so to speak, truths is actually fundamental to Protestant theology. It is on that basis that they fought Roman Catholic Christianity. This is a matter of history. So in R1 and R2, for example, is actually splitting up the Catholic conception of religion into two quadrants. One is on the, the so-called doctrinal thing that you spoke about. Protestantism is also hostile to certain kinds of doctrines, but those that were formulated by the Roman Catholic Church. But Protestants, of course, believe in Bible as the word of God. And there is no question of non-doctrinal thing in fact, pietism or fideism is a very typically Protestant understanding of God relationship. So your R1 and R2 actually is splitting up very classic, very, very classic conceptions of Christianity, religion by Christianity, into Gandhi's conceptions. Maybe Gandhi had that, maybe he did not. But that, then comes my uh, puzzle. Why and what exactly does R1, R2 and R3 distinction do? You say there are three senses. See, a word can have many meanings. So it could be that religion to Gandhi meant all these three meanings could be he's using only one word. 
unless you believe that each word should have one and only one definite meaning, I don't see how you can call them three conceptions of a religion, why not three dimensions of meaning of the word religion to Gandhi. Now, you could say, it helps me understand Gandhi better. I'll come to that in my third puzzle. So my first puzzle is what exactly your R1 and R2 do. They are simply using very classic, centuries old, millennia old problems, uh, uh, understanding of religion by Christianity and you're saying Gandhi understood it. So what exactly does it help you do? Second is, if you approach the issue this way, you see you can't even raise the following question, which for example Sadhananda was raising, namely, was it Gandhi's mode of communicating for which he made use and borrowed from the missionaries under whom he was taught? He didn't know any other way of talking about religion except the what the Protestants taught him. Was it the way he was communicating or was it his idea of religion? That's a question that Siddhanand was raising. So my puzzle to you is how are you going to make the distinction? How will you say which is Gandhi's idea? And how much is it that he was a product of Protestant colonial education? Actually, education of Protestant missionaries. His whole language shows that he was educated by Protestant missionaries. My puzzle is how do you ascribe that as Gandhi's conception? Is it just because he used those words? This brings me to a methodological point you make, because to answer these two questions, you need to answer a methodological question. You said you reject Baconian, Hobbesian conception of science. Well, nobody that I know of in the last 250 years in philosophy ever hung on to uh, Baconians and I find Baconian idea of induction science is held only by social scientists today and not in the history of the last 250 years of philosophers of science. So I'm talking as philosopher of science. Hobbesian conception of science, I don't even know what you're talking about because Hobbes was talking about a model of geometry and there's no such thing as Hobbesian conception of science and history and philosophy of science. This is something probably California has manufactured because they don't understand philosophy of science. Possible. However, oh, that's not the issue. The issue is this. You say you go for hermeneutic, creative hermeneutic interpretation. Then I have a puzzle for you. I hope you will solve this for me. As you know, hermeneutics is a discipline that developed in the West to interpret the Bible. And the reason why they had to interpret the Bible was because Bible appeared to contain contradictions and the belief is that word of God cannot be contradictory. So a hermeneutic ideal of interpretation has one goal, which is basically this case to make the Bible completely consistent. So if you use this hermeneutic way of understanding text, what you call interpretation, then I'm afraid you need one goal also because Suppose you have interpretation X of Gandhi, Vivek has interpretation Y of Gandhi, Akil Bil Kami has Z3 interpretation of Gandhi. How do we decide which of them is better? The only possible way for you is to say that which makes Gandhi more consistent. But then Gandhi is completely contradictory. So let's go to the other extreme. That interpretation which makes Gandhi completely inconsistent is the best interpretation. Or let us go in between the spectrum. 20% consistency Gandhi is good, 21% is bad. In other words, you get caught in absolutely unsolvable problem of how you can even claim that you're making either an interpretation or misinterpretation of Gandhi because how are you going to judge that? If I give a statement Gandhi contradicted it, you could say, yeah, Gandhi is contradictory. Or you could say, no, no, I'll make Gandhi consistent. But then if you make Gandhi completely consistent, if it is possible at all, you are transforming Gandhi into God and his writings into the Bible. That is a problem of hermeneutics, you see. So you cannot simply say, I'm against hypothesis, perhaps this is the point that Sadhana Rajaram was making. Reading Gandhi's text is not a question of interpretation at all. It is not an interpretative problem unless you tell me how do we choose between different interpretations of Gandhi? On what criteria are we going to do that? Otherwise, the only option you have is what Rajarama is saying. Look, begin with the hypothesis about Indian intellectuals, about how they have or they have not made 
protestant theology they wrote deformed or not and by the way deformation distortion doesn't in the least presuppose any normative concept whoever has told you doesn't know the meaning of the word distortion because there are multiple for example a convex and a concave mirror distort an image there's no normativity involved in it at all anyway so the point is how otherwise are you going to say yours is a creative representation misrepresentation how do i know you are not hallucinating about gandhi of course from california people say our hallucination is the truth it's possible but if we come from belgium and kuwempu and we don't understand hallucination we prefer truth i thank you so wow that was quite quite a lot to chew on uh i don't think i can respond to all of it i think the first two parts of it maybe i will consider and think about uh namely the question about protestant christianity uh and then the question about uh what exactly does the distinction between r1 r2 and r3 do i think i'm going to have to bracket those two questions uh i'm simply not ready to respond to them yet uh but i will say that i think there's been a misunderstanding i didn't say that i reject the baconian conception of science uh what i meant was that i really reject that sort of um singular model of interpretation as it applies to uh, or, or that singular sort of scientific model as it applies to the interpretive project why do i because it's this idea that there is a No actually I think hermeneutics is quite See, different. There can only be one true interpretation of the bible. No I actually well okay fine so no, no, otherwise how do you judge it? consistency is your only criteria that interpretation which is maximally consistent is the best interpretation there is a fundamental principle of all hermeneutic interpretations uh i would actually beg to differ um so we must have different understandings of the field of hermeneutics um because um i don't actually think that having a single consistent interpretation and then identifying which is the only correct interpretation is actually the task of hermeneutics so maybe i was in fact trained uh, in a different way of seeing hermeneutics but i actually think that there are different modes of interpretation different forms of hermeneutics and again I, you know it may be that hermeneutics sort of originated in biblical study but it has you know gone on to sort of take multiple forms right and so this may bring us just back to an earlier methodological argument about multiplicity versus singularity that you know we we may have been having in other contexts but i actually don't see the project of interpretation as arriving at one sort of consistent logical the only interpretation of a thinker i really don't um and i actually think that there are various sort of strands uh within the hermeneutic tradition i think there are uh people who have written about interpretation who have talked about creative mis uh creative misreadings creative misreceptions multiple meanings um there there's a lot of talk of the the fact that texts once they come into the world they take on different meanings for different people they take on different meanings for different communities for different purposes so um i'm not really sure why we have to stick to a kind of singular concept of the correct non distorting meaning of the text um so so that's part of I, my i'm sorry i have to response. interrupt you i have to interrupt you either you're saying one of the two you're saying like, help me understand what it is or maybe you're saying something completely different there are 1 billion interpretations of gandhi are you saying they're all as good as each other no all right you're going to choose between them i don't think that we have to choose but if between oh, then the they're right so look, look either every interpretation is right so you don't have to choose or some interpretations are more right than the others then you have to choose my question is how do you choose I, mean, why, why I, i reject the question i'm sorry reject the no, question sorry. problem i reject the question i'd like to move on from this discussion please but but it's very interesting the problem is for instance take any hindu nationalist so vidya savarkar how do you prefer your interpretation above theirs for instance which is i mean i guess you'd like to prefer your interpretation of gandhi above the mainstream hindu nationalist interpretation how i mean How on the basis of what criterion is yeah. what you're asking right yeah. and so you want criteria 
I don't, I have to say, I really have difficulty with this question, I guess. And, and, and maybe there's like a, a, a more fundamental, fundamental disagreement that we're having. Um, but I really, once again, I'm gonna repeat what I said. I, why do we have to distinct, why do we have to say which is the correct interpretation? Right? Because Why I mean, is that the goal? I mean, take Winston Churchill. This is, Gandhi is a naked fakir who is just babbling away. Why is that not? Why is your interpretation better than Churchill's? I don't think it's better. I mean, look, Churchill can say whatever he wants to say about Gandhi. I think the work of scholarship is to offer alternative interpretations and hopefully convince people that these other interpretations are more compelling. Right? I mean, I. I really do believe that. I don't, I don't really understand why it's so controversial. I mean, maybe, again, I was trained differently to think about this. I'm not making a claim about this being the interpretation of Gandhi. I'm not. I'm making a claim about this being one creative way to receive what Gandhi is saying and to make sense of it, right? Um, so I don't really understand why the preoccupation with whether or not this is a better interpretation than any other. Now, now let me say that, of course, not all, what was it, Balu's, you know, one billion interpretations of Gandhi are correct. There are obviously interpretations that are more plausible than others, right? Um, so, yeah, I, 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 I think that that's what I want to say for now. Before I open.